Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, a few new speaking dates to announce. The links are not yet live on my website, but uh, you can mark your calendars if you live in the relevant cities. I'll be in Seattle on December 6th, San Francisco on December 7th, Boston on January 11th, D.C. on January 12th, and Philadelphia on January 14th. Those last three are surrounding the January 13th date in New York, which is virtually sold out. I believe there are 12 seats left last time I looked. So more to come about those events. Supporters of the podcast will get a link to tickets on September 20th, and then tickets will be available to the general public a week after that. So you can see my events page on my website for more details. And you can also join my email list if you want to hear about these things in the most reliable way. Okay, today I am speaking with Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. They are filmmakers who have made some of the most beloved documentaries of our time and certainly changed the way that documentary films have been made over the last few decades. And they're releasing their latest film, The Vietnam War, this weekend on PBS. It premieres on Sunday, the 17th of September, and it will be available on DVD and Blu-ray very soon after that. This documentary is in 10 parts. It's 18 hours long, and as you'll hear in this conversation, it fairly blew my mind. Uh, it really is a remarkable piece of work, which took Ken and Lynn and the rest of their team 10 years to make. So you'll hear much more about it and my experience watching it over the next hour, but I really recommend that you take the time to watch this series. If you thought you knew something about the Vietnam War and what it was like to live through it, I would dare say even if you fought in that war, there's something to be learned from this documentary. So, now I bring you Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. I am here with Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. Ken and Lynn, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Well, listen, I, to say that I'm a fan of your work is certainly an understatement, and I, I think that's probably an understatement for almost anyone who encounters your work. You have made so many amazing films together, probably most famously The, the Civil War, which virtually everyone has seen, I imagine, but there was Prohibition, Jazz, Baseball, just so many great films. And these are, these are miniseries, really. I mean, these are many hours long. And now you've released, or you're about to release, the latest, which is the Vietnam War, which is 18 hours long. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, 10 episodes, 18 hours. Yeah. So I am about 15 hours into it. Don't spoil the end for me. We win this war, right? <laughs> I, do, I really don't want to get, uh, do a spoiler uh, thing for you. I've had a full immersion experience that most people watching it on PBS won't because, uh, you know, I, I have the discs and I, I was... I've watched those 15 hours in the last, you know, 48. So, oh wow. It, it really it really amazingly intense and it strikes me that this is an utterly unique document for reasons that you couldn't fully control. I mean, first of all, there was an endless amount of footage of the actual war, which you can't say of of every war. And there's also the fact that there were so many people who experienced the war who are still alive who you could talk to. And then there's the additional fact that we are at a, enough remove from this particular war in time, now about 50 years, so that you can have this perspective on it and give it this amazingly even-handed treatment. And finally, and this is something you really had no control over, there's the fact that you're releasing this now, at this moment in history, and, and, it, and it has a resonance, which I really, I feel like it wouldn't have had had you released this let's say, in the first term of Obama's administration. I mean, it, just, it, it strikes me as an incredibly relevant and prescient document right now. It, 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 it's like we're looking into a time capsule, but it's also, I also felt like I was looking into a crystal ball that was 50 years old. And, and so I, I don't know if it strikes you that way, but it just seems like this Very is a, a gold so. mine. Yeah. This is the great gift of history that we always forget. And I would suggest that had we released it 10 years ago, it might also have stunning and uh, different kind of resonances. 
uh, human nature never changes. And so whatever's going on now, the past is always going to resonate with it because we can see features of it. But I think it's quite startling right now and nothing that we intentionally timed uh, the, the, the completion of the film to. Indeed, most of the editorial work uh, was done on this before the uh, caucus and primary seasons began in the election. But this is a film about mass demonstrations taking place all across the country against the current administration, about a White House in disarray, obsessed with leaks, about a president certain the press is lying, making up stories about him, about asymmetrical warfare that confounds the mighty might of the U.S. military, about huge document drops of stolen classified material into the public sphere that destabilizes the conventional wisdom and the current conversation, and accusations that a political campaign reached out during the time of a national election to a foreign power to help them influence that national election. Yeah. That's pretty stunning. Yeah. <laughs> but all of these were true back in 2006 when Lynn and I began working on it, as they are still true now. And all of them and dozens more are from Vietnam that resonate in the present. Strangely, some of the, the resonances are inconvenient or at least uncomfortable in, in that their polarity is, is reversed in a way. Yes. I mean, so, for instance, I, there was some, I forget which administration did it. I guess it was LBJ. Well, at, at some point, there, there was the allegation that, that Russian operatives were stoking the, the anti-war movement, essentially. And, you know, whether or not that could have been true then, it, it, it certainly played as a completely cynical bit of paranoia. Whereas now we have this, the increasingly well-documented meddling of Russia into our system. It's, it was a bewildering experience, frankly, to, to watch this film. Yes, and then you have the actual evidence that the Nixon campaign reached out to South Vietnam to get them to boycott the peace talks that had suddenly improved and were improving uh, Humphrey's chances. And um, Johnson gets wind of this and calls up Everett Dirksen, the Republican leader in the Senate and said, this is treason. And Dirksen says, yes. And in our film, the next call that you hear is Nixon sort of saying, oh, you know, Mr. President, I never do this. And Nixon's lying and the president knows it. And so you have an exact correlation, just as the other one seemed kind of absurd and, and paranoid. Yeah. But now true, this one is, you know, a, a fact, but we're now trying to connect the dots uh, in this moment uh, about that. So it's you know, plus ça change. Yeah. So well, let's step back from the, the actual content of the film for a moment and just talk about your making of it. And then I want to move through the the story a little bit systematically because it's it really is an education that most of us haven't had on just how damaging the the Vietnam War was to our society and to Vietnam. And it was a disaster on on so many levels. When did you guys decide to make this film? Well, we, we've been thinking about the Vietnam War as one of the most important events in American history since the Second World War. And it's been sort of on the back burner for many years, sort of lurking there, along with many other subjects. And when we finished our film on the Second World War, uh, it hadn't been broadcast yet, but it was around 2006, Ken turned to me at one of the mixing sessions and said, you know, we really, we have to do Vietnam. And I remember saying, uh, I agree, which part? And he said, all of it. And I said, okay, that's great. Let's do it. And yet we took a big, deep gulp because we knew even then how enormously complicated and challenging this story would be to tell. And it has turned out to be the case. We really wanted to try to tell it from every possible side and to listen to people who have very strong feelings about it, sometimes conflicted feelings, and to understand Vietnamese perspectives as well as Americans. And so it took us 10 years to kind of wrestle this enormously challenging story to the ground. Mm. And, and the footage you have is amazing, both the contemporaneous footage of, of actual battles, which you appear to have from both sides. You have North Vietnamese footage too, right? Yes. It's just astonishing that this even exists. And you seemingly have an endless amount of footage of our own side, which is also, it just strikes me as strange that it exists in so many cases. Well, we had a free press that was unfettered in their access to the war and the, and the theater of war in this case, unlike World War II in Korea, where the press was very much censored and controlled. And 
Vietnam represents that one outlying situation that permitted the press at great risk uh, to themselves. And in fact, hundreds of journalists and, and videographers and filmmakers and sound men were killed during the course of the war to provide this, you know, seemingly bottomless amount of, of footage. What happens, though, is that they congregate in archives all around the world, and a traditional film production only has the resources to spend a little time in each archive if they can even get there. So what happens is that we tend to push around our plate the same footage over and over again. And it's footage that we have, but we've also had the luxury of spending a decade and having the deep dive and permitting us to go into the archives and spend more than just a cursory amount of time but literally months and years getting to know them and and finding out all the nooks and crannies of that archives, not just footage, but also still photographs, to benefit this production. So while the classic images are there, the classic um, uh, famous moments, we are able to deconstruct them in, we think, a different kind of light, whether it's the Napalm Girl, Kim Phuc, or it's the assassination of Lem in the streets of Saigon during the Tet Offensive by the head of the National Police, Luan, or other famous things, we, we, can, we can in some ways deconstruct them. But more importantly, for these quotidian moments with fighter pilots and helicopter crew chiefs and Marines and army guys ambushed or in battle charging up hills, you have a kind of immersive uh, experience that, that places you there. And one thing you should know is that 98% of the footage comes to us without any sound. And we have to therefore then research ourselves what an M16 sounds like as opposed to an AK-47, as opposed to a traditional tripod-mounted machine gun, as opposed to other kinds of armaments, and what the sounds of the engines of an A3 as opposed to an A4 sound like, and what they actually look like to get it straight. And so much of the years involved in this is is the attempt at verisimilitude. And in many cases, those battles that you referred to have new footage, perhaps never before seen footage, but also a sound effects track that may number in to 150 or 160 individual sounds to create the moment of battle. I didn't know that, but it, you know, in retrospect, it seems like the sound design was amazing. I mean, it just, there was something I, I felt like I had not actually seen war footage like this before. Well, we, we were our own sound editors we've worked with for years and years, and they are a remarkable group of people. What was the most telling test was when we would have playbacks of the completed episodes and invite periodically the head of the archive, say at CBS or ABC or NBC, a principal source of, of material, as you can imagine, and watching them watch stunned at how their footage had been used intermixed with their competitors' footage, and then finally brought to life with this complex sound effects. And they found themselves as um, distracted and immersed into the story uh, when their job was to sort of uh, evaluate the uses of it. And we felt thrilled, and they were extraordinarily helpful at every juncture in making sure we could find and get every lost bit of footage, every, you know, obscure bit of footage. And um, that extended to still photographs and audio tapes from the presidential library, the, the presidential tapes that are so extraordinarily unbelievable and damning. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just just to have that as a resource. I mean, those LBJ tapes are unbelievable because what what you have, uh, both in the case of LBJ and Nixon, I guess Kennedy too, you have the ultimate mind reading machine. And what is perfectly obvious from the earliest stages of this war is how hopeless it appeared even from their perspective. And yet we meander further and further into this quagmire for years and years. And I mean, there's a point in, in the series where you think, surely the, the, the war is about over given what we're hearing, and yet it's just beginning. It's, I want to ask you a little more about your process before we dive into it, but perhaps you can address this question. I mean, how is it, given what they were clearly thinking, that this war was possible, that it unfolded the way it did. Well, you know, we, we don't have historians appearing on screen interpreting what is the story being told. So we really try to just put the pieces together and using this 
remarkable real-time audio of conversations in the White House um, as you hear LBJ and Nixon and Kennedy talking about what they're doing and their decision-making process and the information they have available to them. And then you have to, as a viewer, sort of try to think yourself about, well, why are they continuing to prosecute a war when they don't think they have a very good chance of success? And one of the things that comes up again and again is that they're worried about getting reelected. They're worried about their popularity. They're worried about whether the American public would want to be told that we're not going to win the war. That's a pervasive theme, a drumbeat from very early on. And that's, we live in a democracy. That's a real question for people who assume, you know, the greatest levels of power. They're always worrying about getting reelected. And the Vietnam War is a huge byproduct of that. Yeah, it was this concern over the loss of face, which it is a kind of psychosis when you actually understand what's happening on the ground and you're just sending waves upon waves of people to die for something that on every level, the, the, the descriptions of these battles where the whole goal is to take a hill, but there's no point in actually taking the hill. And once they take it at the cost of hundreds of lives, they occupy it for like an hour and then walk on down the other side because there was no point in getting the hill in the first place. The picture of futility that develops here over the course of the series, you, you basically live out the political implications of it hour after hour as you see the, the resistance to this war building. Again, before we jump into the content, I, I want to just ask you a little more about your process. How do you collaborate on a film like this? I mean, are you together most of the time? Are you in different states? Uh, I I live and and work in New Hampshire, and Lynn uh, lives and works in New York. So the New York office became the kind of production center f during the production. The film was edited in New Hampshire, and so there's thanks to the way we're talking now all sorts of ways in which we collaborate instantaneously uh, on this. And it's just, uh, we have an extraordinary group of colleagues, Jeffrey Ward, the writer I've worked with for, you know, 35 years. Um, editors I've worked with for, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, that amount of time as well, 30 plus years. Co-producers uh, that have assisted us, people who are researching pictures. It's a, it's a extraordinarily close-knit family divided between New Hampshire and New York and, and lots of communications. And it's a wonderful process. And you're right to focus on that because process is everything that we're about. Um, we're not about setting a, a prescribed uh, research period and then followed by a writing period out of which is produced some document that is now written in stone that informs the shooting and the editing. But in fact, an open-ended process that never stops researching, that never stops writing, that is constantly willing to shoot or reshoot or add a new interview, and is always looking for new material, whether it's footage or still photographs. And I think more to the point, it's easy to say never stop researching, but that means constantly of being where, particularly on a subject as controversial and as constantly shifting as the scholarship about Vietnam, aware of the most recent scholarship. So we, we find a lot of our work just changing, you know, a, a number from four to three when we find out that that was how many regiments of North Vietnamese soldiers went down the Ho Chi Minh Trail that month to try to get it right. The last year and a half, as we were sound editing and onlining and mixing, we were also removing adjectives and adverbs that we thought maybe, perhaps, might have suggested a particular bent. We had no agenda. We had no axe to grind. This was not a polemical piece. We wanted to be umpires calling balls and strikes, and it was hugely important that our process serve that, and it has for a long time. And I think this production, more than anything else, bears the fruits of that kind of diligent adherence to, to process insofar as this was the most challenging of any production we've ever engaged in, and very satisfying because we were able, even in the darkest moments, to trust to our process and to yield to it and understand that eventually structures and arcs and storylines would emerge, that things that we seemed overly identified with 
would be lost, that new things we would have to incorporate, that the little darlings would all have to be eliminated, but new uh, ways of understanding it. We, you know, filmmakers, particularly my experience is when you have a scene that's working, the last thing you want to do is change it if it's working. But inevitably, in every scene, you found out new information that complicated each minute uh, dynamic within every scene. And instead of sort of pushing back and perhaps settling, we sort of reveled in and moved towards that complication and and tried to, every time, engage what was difficult uh, about this and, and proved our point that we felt all along that particularly in war, but also in many other things, um, more than one truth can obtain at the same time and still be a truth. There's not a moral relativism to that. There, there is just depending on your perspectives. And as Lynn said, we, in, we had, had decided at the beginning to engage all sorts of perspectives, not just American perspectives, but North Vietnamese, the winners, and South Vietnamese, the losers, who lost not only a war, but their country, which disappeared off the face of the earth uh, after barely 20 years in existence. And so every day was a constant reminder that that open-endedness, the willingness to be corrigible, the willingness to suddenly realize you might have to double back on yourself, the necessity to, at the very beginning, jettison preconceptions and baggage in favor of a Vietnam War that betrays even those like me who lived through it, uh, betrays our original, uh, you know, con conventional wisdom about it. it. It was exhilarating and humiliating and about as stimulating as you could possibly imagine. I, I just wanted to chime in one thing about sure. the way that we collaborate, because as Ken was speaking, I was, it's hard to explain, but, you know, we're, we're documentarians, right? So we're not making up a story. We're actually trying to organize this enormous amount of material that Ken described into a coherent narrative that works sort of chapter by chapter, scene by scene, episode by episode into some kind of coherent whole over 18 hours. And what happens is it's a process of distillation and it's enormously creative and it is enormously collaborative. And, you know, it, it really comes down to sort of intuitively suggesting ideas about what might or might not work in the film and then trying them out and listening to each other and then trying to make the film better. And that is what we do day after day after day in a very open way that I think is unusual in how um, most people go about their jobs. We just go, get up every day, go to work, eager to hear what each other has to say and how to make our film better. And it could be little tiny decisions or huge decisions about, you know, what's in an episode or what's in a scene or which character we're going to um, amplify and what we're going to cut and what word we're going to choose and where we're going to put the comma and which picture we're going to look at and what, you know, what music we're going to hear and where the sound effect is going to go. There's a million decisions, and it is, as Ken said, a process. And one of the most, it's almost euphoric when we're all working together toward this thing that ends up being bigger than any of us. And uh, we, I just feel very lucky that we get to do it together. I'm glad you mentioned the music because talk about an embarrassment of riches. Yes. And it, it's, it's actually a, a point that's made in the film about the protest movement that somebody at some point says that the protest movement itself was immensely empowered by just how good the music of the time was, which is something I had never really thought of. But, it, but that point is brought home in just how you score this thing, because it's just one fantastic song after another. I want to go back to something you said, Ken, about moral relativism, because what you get here is not a picture of moral relativism, but it's just there's the status of the war in, in so many respects is so ambiguous morally that it almost demanded it, the kind of even-handedness you, you described, whereas you, you, you went there with, as though from Mars without any agenda, and you just let each side tell its story. And it's an amazing experience to witness a war from both sides in this way, where there, there aren't obvious bad guys. I mean, there, there are some obvious bad guys, and, and, and perhaps we can talk about that. But the, the picture of the pointless wastage of human life and the gains such as they are of civilization is brought home by this because it's just you can understand both sides and yet the whole thing seems so profoundly unnecessary 
it, it is remarkable, and it's not a story you could have told, say, of our fight against the, the Nazis. No, and and we did do a film, Lynn and I, on the history of World War II, and and while it was a challenging and complicated narrative, and we had to devise new and uh, unique ways of perceiving it. Nothing had the kind of degree of complication about it. But I, I like your idea of being from Mars. I mean, I think we really kind of felt that in many, many ways, that we were obligated to, to not just jettison preconceptions, but to try to see something that has undergone so much change in the scholarship that things like the just the the sort of centrality of Ho Chi Minh's leadership by episode one is already challenged by competing figures in the Politburo who will eventually supplant Ho as the dominant figure in charge of things. And and that's, you know, you could have blown us over with a with a feather uh, early on learning that and then how you integrate that, how you introduce and and um, developed that character who is actually uh, the dominant figure in the Politburo uh, throughout the film was a great challenge. And what you understand early on is that music is your best helper. And unfortunately for most films, music is something that's sort of added at the end to amplify emotions you hope you hope are there. And sometimes we're very familiar with a very wonderful, popular soundtrack of lots of pieces of music that actually isn't really about the subject matter. But here we were absolutely certain that our music had to reflect the time. And so we have 125 pieces of music, which we could have never afforded, but we went first to the Beatles and for the first time ever, they licensed uh, at a minuscule rate uh, songs to us, as did Bob Dylan, which permitted us to go out to all the other dozens and dozens of artists that make up this most great sound effects, uh, soundtrack, music soundtrack. And they all agreed. And people who've never licensed things, Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young uh, with Ohio and the Hendrix estate, notoriously uh, difficult, were in fact the exact opposite because they understood that we'd be using this music from the beginning, baking it into, letting the music be part of the structure of the scenes and the episodes we were constructing. And in addition, we reached out and asked Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross if they would provide original composed music for this, which they did, almost three hours of which uh, we've used and reused throughout the film, which gives it its anxious and a completely appropriate tone, and yet still ends up resolving itself in some incredibly harmonious and even emotional ways. And this Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensemble took Vietnamese melodies and transformed them in a unique way. So we had a kind of triple threat with the music that helped us address the, the larger thing that you're bringing up, Sam, which is just this notion of, of the unrelentingness of this story. And what I still find is you're standing there in episode three, and it's called The River Styx, and we're c putting boots on the ground, and You've already busted through a few road signs saying, bridges out, stop, bridges out ahead, stop. And, and we're suddenly in midair. And you, if you lift your head up, you go, my God, there's seven more episodes to go. Yeah. <laughs> and this becomes almost Dante-like in terms of the descent you have to take. And yes, and yet it's mitigated by the transformative nature of the testimony of not just the variety, and it's a complete variety of Americans but by the variety of North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese and Viet Cong guerrillas, both soldiers and civilians. All of this, you know, is what we, why it took a, a decade for us to sort of wrestle to the ground, as Lynn said. Let's go back to the moment in history where this made the most sense. Let's just talk about our involvement in Vietnam. And I, I guess the, the point, um, and this probably comes around episode two, where I, I guess I sort of understood how this happened was when Kennedy is, is the president, and at some point you are conveying that you know, the, the lesson that he drew from World War II was that ambitious dictatorships have to be opposed. You win no points with the universe for giving someone like Hitler uh, more runway. So the moment you recognize how evil a movement is, 
or an ideology is and how empowered it's becoming, it never gets easier to oppose it. And, you know, that, in, in hindsight, against Hitler, that makes total sense. And you could see how everyone drew that lesson. And it was also, we should remind ourselves, it was pretty clear at that point how evil communism was. And I mean, well, whatever you think of it by reading Marx, it was pretty clear that its application in the real world was selecting for some of the worst behavior human beings are capable of. Well said. Absolutely. So it's kind of easy to see where Kennedy thought we can't let these countries fall to communism. Take me there and how do you think about, let's go president by president, how do you think about Kennedy's thinking there? And I guess we should remind ourselves he was also, from a political point of view, he was worried about being perceived as not being strong enough. There had been the Bay of Pigs at a certain point here in the story, and he was feeling a lot of pressure to contain the spread of communism in what he called a, a limited war. How do you think about Kennedy in the beginning of, of this story? Well, you know, it's, um, it's dangerous to judge the past by the perspective of today. So we've tried very hard to just unravel the story as it happened and let it, the facts speak for themselves. And the crucial mistake that was made before Kennedy ever got there was the conflation of the end of the colonial era and the Cold War. And that in Vietnam, it's confusing, perhaps, that you had both a nationalist movement and a communist movement that were, became merged into one movement. And so we were up against not just the spread of communism, but also, you know, uh, people wanting self-determination and not wanting to be controlled by what they viewed as an imperial or colonial power. And so, uh, unfortunately for America, we sort of oversimplified a very complicated problem and put it into a box into which it didn't really perfectly fit. And that was the source of so much tragedy after the fact. Um, and as we said earlier, the Kennedy administration, on some degree, sort of understood that, but on another level, also appreciated that the Cold War was real. There was this threat of nuclear war. And that was really, it was in some ways, fear of Armageddon that overshadowed everything. The Cuban Missile Crisis came and went and was terrifying. And so the sense that it wasn't only to stop the dominoes from falling in Southeast Asia, but a sense that we had to show the communist world that we would um, support our allies, that our word was good, that, you know, that we shouldn't be messed with, and that we meant what we said, partly drew us into the problems of trying to solve the sort of irresolvable conflict in Vietnam. And you hear Kennedy and his colleagues, his closest allies, wrestling with this throughout his presidency, and yet committing more and more advisors, American advisors at that point, to try to arrest the spread of the revolution there, and also realizing from the beginning that it's not really working. I guess we should just underline that crucial bit of confusion, because it's actually stated in the film that, that we mistook the populist opposition to colonialism for the pure ideological efflorescence of Marxism. We thought we were fighting the Cold War when we were actually continuing to impose what was perceived as colonial domination, and we weren't going to win that one ideologically. That's right, and I think you can use the arc of Kennedy's experience as a very instructive understanding of the way in which the group think about Cold War mentality uh, takes over. As a young congressman, he's on a fact-finding visit. He hears the guns. The French and the, uh, the, the southern Vietnamese are sort of dismissive. It's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. But he's taken aside by Seymour Topping, a reporter who says, look, this is a terrible situation. And Kennedy is convinced Topping is right and warns his own constituents when he gets back that this is uh, foredoomed failure if we were to get involved. But his thinking, as does the thinking of uh, the vice president under the next president, Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, and one of the leaders of the Senate, Lyndon Johnson, begin to realize that they're all, regardless of party affiliation, now, uh, whether they're aware of it or not, are captive of that Cold War mentality, where what becomes, as you say quite uh, correctly, uh, essentially colonial and post-colonial manifestations and the independence movements and the insurgencies that they uh, 
produce, particularly in a post-World War II environment when, when the whole dynamic, the whole paradigm has been turned upside down, somehow gravitates to an easily um, understandable uh, dialectic of just good versus evil, us versus them, communism versus democracy, and is fed by a military-industrial complex that doesn't want the steady profits of the Second World War to disappear and are happy to add their voice, uh, amplify a call for these limited con uh, you know, conflicts, as opposed to the alternative, the alternative being nuclear annihilation in World War III. And so what you have in Vietnam is superimposed circumstances or interpretation of circumstances that just have a way of kind of sitting and festering in relation to one another. Civil war, war for independence, war of ideology, proxy war, limited war, the place where instead of fighting the Russians with thermonuclear devices, uh, we're fighting them and the Chinese in this tiny uh, country that in itself can't even decide what this struggle is about, except that they know that they don't want foreign domination and they want to be themselves, uh, something we ought to be very familiar with. So I, I think that the table setting that takes place, the, the geopolitical table setting that takes place in episode one and two is sort of baffling in one extent, but also completely human in another. This, this is what human beings do. Um, it isn't just something that Americans are particularly susceptible to or victors or arrogance is. It's just part of the way the human dynamic will always choose the belligerent stance over the more difficult negotiation and even reconciliation. There's one figure here who has come in for harsh criticism under the glare of history. It's Robert McNamara. But it's interesting. His change of heart in the context of this documentary, when you're, you're having to spectate on the surreal pointlessness of everyone else's just persisting basically under the sunk cost fallacy. We've been in this so long, we just have to keep going. His change of heart really has the stature of a kind of wisdom that is shared by almost no one. Robert McNamara is one of the masterminds of our involvement in this war, but at a certain point, he decides this is unwinnable and, and that we need to get out. And he seems to hold to that in a way that is not really absorbed by the people around him. And it comes in the, after we hear about a top-secret analysis of our, essentially our motives for continuing our involvement in the war. And it, was, it broke down as 70% as to avoid humiliation, 20% to deter China, and 10% to help the Vietnamese. That recipe for our own moral confusion and masochism, really, is there on paper being talked about. And you hear, again, this audio from, from LBJ, uh, probably at this point, is just amazing. I mean, he's so obviously reluctant to get involved in this and so despairing of what was happening over there, and yet totally incapable of contemplating getting out. Well, you know, um, the moral dimensions obviously weigh so heavily here. And one of the really difficult things to contemplate is that that 10% to help the Vietnamese, if that was our goal, you know, the war ended up causing the deaths of 3 million Vietnamese, 58,000 Americans, which is an enormous tragedy for our country, but 3 million Vietnamese in a country of 30 million. And you hear on tape in different ways, Robert McNamara and President Johnson sort of discussing how the war is going and at one point, McNamara talks about, well, we're not killing enough people to break their morale, but if we just kill a few more, maybe that will work. And so you see how leaders have to kind of detach themselves from the true human effect of the war that they're waging, especially on another people far away, half a world away that you don't really know or understand. And that is a, a deep tragedy of the war that um, it seems clear Robert McNamara wrestled with, even though we never spoke about it publicly not during the war and not after the war and not for many, many years, did he really sort of give voice to the enormous moral conundrum that um, was unleashed. I agree with Lynn. I think that's exactly right. The word tragedy is, is really etched over everyone. I mean, 
McNamara can't be excused. He had his doubts, as did people in the Truman administration and the Eisenhower administration and, and throughout. And the fact that he maintained a public posture of, of optimism in the face of, of all of this empirical evidence, not just of the American experience, but dating back, duplicating the French experience, um, we ought to have known better in that regard. But we have you know, what? what is tragedy, but maybe the inability to in any way forestall the expression of negative aspects within a personality. It's not the only thing they have. And what makes tragedy tragedy is that we can see the tension between the positive as well as the negative operating within and between peoples. And so what makes this so large is that you just feel like there is a momentum that anybody, a schoolchild, could understand did represent, as Kennedy said, foredoomed failure, uh, but nobody can stop it, and nobody's able to stop themselves. And that impulse uh, that you describe, Sam, is, is throughout the film. I mean, at one point, a Marine in the context of combat said, you know, we're not the dominant species on the planet because we're nice. And people like to complain that the military turns young men into killers, I'd like to suggest it's only finishing school, is a damning statement that doesn't regard, it doesn't just doesn't apply to combat, but applies to all of these, as Lynn was talking about, abstracted decisions making, being made at 30,000 feet by policymakers who, who are, you know, as we say in the beginning, decent people trying to come to, you know, some sort of solution against things that seem, at least on paper and in ideological evidence, as being good and bad, but can't do anything but but put, commit themselves to bad things. And that's the nature of tragedy. That's why it's so interesting to watch and why, you know, we will e- forever be, you know, watching versions of Hamlet and Macbeth and, and, and King Lear and all of these uh, masterful tragedies. And Vietnam is its own natural one. One of the levels of tragedy when we, we step back from the leaders and their um, flaws or human frailties is that the decisions that they're making are having epic consequences for ordinary people in America and Vietnam and the people that we got to know that we've alluded to and Ken was speaking about earlier, you know, um, young men who believe that their duty as citizens is to serve their country and they are the generation that grew up after World War II, and they want to, you know, be heroic and be patriotic and go to Vietnam as a result of that. And then many of the people that we talked to, you know, came back with serious questions about what they'd been asked to do and what their friends had died for and the men that they had killed. And, you know, at one point, one of the veterans says, you know, um, that he realized after the Pentagon Papers were published that Robert McNamara had determined that the war was unwinnable by 1965, and yet this guy went over there, you know, in 68, and he said, you know, is that what I killed people for? So um, the consequences, we understand in the context of making this film, the tragedies both for the leaders and their inabilities, as Ken was saying, but also for the ordinary people who really bear the brunt. And that's one aspect of this which is so unique to this conflict. The, The way our troops were treated when they returned. I think one of the legacies of Vietnam, at least I I hope it is, is that we managed to differentiate our criticism of a war and the policy that, that brought us to war from a moral criticism of the troops who are serving in that war, because we clearly did not understand how to differentiate this after Vietnam. And you have people who, as you said, many of whom were just as morally conflicted about the policy as the protesters, but they were coming home only to be spat upon and further isolated and talk about heaping tragedy on tragedy. Exactly. And I think that one, you, could, you could say that a, probably a permanent lesson learned from Vietnam is that we won't blame the warriors. I think in some ways, that has been exaggerated. You can see very early in the uh, protest march banners that they're saying, bring the GIs home. And there are many people who are not spitters or or baby killer shouters and things like that. 
But enough soldiers had that experience that we, I, I think we've all, regardless of our political persuasions, have come to understand the folly of that and that we really uh, did that in the absence of um, being able to hold to account uh, the policymakers who, who brought that. And yet the policymakers who made that war happen all had the war uh, definitely shorten their political careers. It's true of Lyndon Johnson and it's true of Richard Nixon, though we don't always, and you'll see in the last hours of the film, not wanting to ruin it for you, <laughs> the ways in which his political demise comes very much uh, as a result of uh, Vietnam-related um, things. We, we like to think of it as domestic political paranoia, but it has its direct connections to uh, his, his paranoia about information about his conduct in that 1968 election coming out. I think it might have been the first line of the film in the first episode, coming home from Vietnam was as close to as traumatic as the war itself. That's correct. Yeah. That is the first English words that you hear in this film. And, and it's followed by a stunning admission that he and his wife had been friends with another couple for 12 years, and it was only the wives talking that they had discovered they had both been Marines in Vietnam and that no one had said a word about that. And at the end of the introduction, another soldier uh, at, in another parade, this is taking place over footage of a parade um, in Vietnam, uh, is saying the exact same thing, that, that the veterans don't talk about it. And so what you have is essentially this secret war, secret because of how much wasn't confessed to the American public at the time it should have been, but secret all also because we have taken the facts of it, the results of it, the displeasure with it, and buried it, and that it becomes hugely toxic for us when we do that, as so much of our repressed psychology is. And there can be a, a sort of toxicity to a collective repressed um, memory, and that it becomes incumbent upon us to figure out ways in which we can have di daylight with regard to Vietnam. And I think covering it from so many diverse perspectives, having a kind of 360 view, creating a space in which nobody's wrong, in which we're able to just dispassionately talk about things and not necessarily have to point arrows of shame or arrows of glory in any uh, direction, but realize that war offers us an opportunity to see human nature on steroids, but also to see not just conflicts between nations, but conflicts within individuals. And so half the people that you meet in this film on camera undergo profound psychological and emotional transformations in the course of this war, having, as you suggest, Sam, uh, their own doubts, but not willing to, to, to let anyone else go and fight for them, or seeing that their absence of courage in refusing the draft was the real tragedy, or serving, you know, not blindly, but in a dedicated fashion, and then coming home and uh, having your whole molecular system rearranged by the protests that are going on, and find yourself in another mindset yet again. And we try just to accept and embrace the fact that that's what we complicated and deeply flawed human beings do all the time. You know, I was I was in Vietnam recently because we've had the whole film translated into Vietnamese, and all 18 hours will be streaming on the PBS website, pbs.org slash the Vietnam War, and it will be available in Vietnam so the Vietnamese can see this story in a way that they, it turns out, have never understood their own war or the war that you know, they also experienced. And we were showing clips to some people there in a a man about my age, I think, um, probably was 10 years old in 1975. He said, you know, I'm going to have nightmares tonight after seeing the pieces of the film that you showed because I remember the war and fleeing from Da Nang to try to get somewhere away from the communists. That was my family, too. And you know what? Since then, I do not think about the war. He said in Vietnam, they have a saying, we celebrate the good things and the bad things we put into the drawer and we shut the drawer and we don't open it. And he said, you know, um, that's how he's lived his life until now. And he realized in watching the film that you have to open that drawer and take out the things that you don't want to talk about and you have to face them. And so it's just interesting in listening to Ken speak about how um, American veterans don't um, talk about the war. It turns out that, and Vietnamese as well, 
that there's maybe the film will help um, to open up a kind of conversation there as well as here. Well, it's really a testament to how you've approached making this film that you could stream it in Vietnam and imagine that it would be a totally positive, not to say pleasant, but positive and cathartic experience to have people see it there. Again, this is really the, in some ways, the view from nowhere or everywhere that is brought to bear on this tragedy. We've we've had such great responses. We've been on the road with the film in the United States, but also, as Lynn says, in Vietnam. And to have these kind of very similar uh, cathartic moments is is really heartening. And and we always speak in a way about the cliche of a national conversation. That's that's an impossible thing to have. The conversations happen on the intimate level that we're having one right now, and they're perhaps overheard or shared or passed on. And what we hope is that you get fathers and sons, you know, talking about what you did in the war for the first time, or perhaps granddaughters and grandmothers about why they attended this protest and why they spoke out the way they did, and begin to feed, uh, I think, an inherent yearning as as much as we focused on the aspects of, of human nature that are so catastrophic and so violent and so wrong that we also have in this story all the seeds of the best impulses of people, not just to say protest something that they felt was morally unjust and do it in a courageous and nonviolent way, but the ways in which even our warriors have resolves uh, things in reconciliation and love and fellowship for the other. It may be unresolved for us here in, in the United States, and it may be unresolved for the Vietnamese there in Vietnam, but it's also, uh, there's an extraordinary exchange between the two countries. We are now allies and trading partners. They have uh, a wonderful, ambitious, entrepreneurial spirit. They love us. Uh, people, Americans going there, love them. And, and, and there's, as you'll see in our last episode, a, a, an amazing sort of fellowship that has, has sort of, you know, overtaken both sides. One, of course, always wishes that human beings would skip to the reconciliation right. from the beginning, but that's not our lot, and we will pay the price in future wars, but also have the opportunity to learn from these extraordinary uh, moments uh, that take place during war of love and fellowship and and brotherhood and camaraderie and community and uh, a lot of the free electrons that I would consider positive in addition to the to the unrelenting, sometimes it seems, tragedy and folly of it all. Well, listen, I, I am aware that this conversation is functioning as an infomercial for this amazing series, <laughs> and, and I want it to. This is not normally how I uh, think of my podcast, but I mean, the, the goal of this conversation is to convince our listeners that they should be sitting in front of their televisions or their computers for 18 hours because it, it really is an amazing experience. So tell people the various ways that, that can be sure. done. Sure. Sure. You know, Sam, and one thing you said at the beginning of our wonderful conversation, and we're both so grateful for your Indeed, thoughtfulness you. and attention uh, to this, and, and particularly for the time and space to be able to develop and, and play out themes and ideas and, and questions and, and pains, um, is that it is possible to have an immersive experience the way you've just had, which is that this will begin broadcasting on Sunday, September 17th on PBS. They'll play each episode one night a week for five straight nights, but they'll play those episodes twice. So if you get home late, you can watch the second showing of episode one. If you go to bed early, you can watch the early uh, showing of episode uh, one, and then the next night, episode two, twice, etc., ending on Thursday night, and then picking up again on Sunday the 24th for the final back half of the, the, the 10 episodes, the last five episodes. Um, but on Tuesday the 19th, everything will be released in DVD and Blu-ray. Also on Sunday the 17th, uh, those first five episodes will be available for streaming free of charge. And uh, that will permit that immersive experience. And the following Sunday, all 10 will then therefore be available uh, to be streamed. The PBS stations will launch marathons on the weekends to catch you up that first weekend on what you've missed before the second weekend. And then when it's all over, PBS will launch this as a weekly series on Tuesday nights. Uh, 
uh, that will permit no, right. every which way people, however they digest their uh, content, however they binge or uh, sip slowly, uh, to imbibe the Vietnam War and get to have the immersive experience that we've tried to design over the last decade and the one it seems that you, Sam, are having. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, I will link to whatever you want me to link to on my blog where I embed this so people have access to that information. Is there anything else you want people to know about how to follow you online or uh, anything else you want to say about your experience making this film? Because I, I know you're in the middle of a quite a press junket now and, and uh, our time is elapsing. Well, do you think I, maybe I should just share briefly one of the comments we've been talking about a lot since we came back from Vietnam and just been so interesting to see one of the elderly veterans who is in the film who came to New Hampshire and screened the film with us and had such thoughtful reactions to it that we filmed him right then and there in Ken's barn because he just was such a deep thinker. Um, his name is Win Knopp, and he's a revered writer and teacher in Vietnam. And he's he was the first person in Vietnam to see the entire series subtitled. And he said that um, it was revelatory to him because before he saw the film, he had seen the American uh, country as divided and riven by protest during the war. He thought it was a sign of weakness. And he felt that even to this day, you know, that America, why were we still haunted by the Vietnam War? And that, you know, why do we keep on going back to it? And why didn't we just get over it? And as he saw the film, he realized these were great signs of strength of our democracy and that he hoped that one day they would be able to have the same kind of reckoning with the war and its cost in Vietnam. And, you know, that he found it heartening that this film, which covers this tragic episode between our two countries, would actually help us understand ourselves, Americans understand themselves, Vietnamese understand each other, and our two countries to understand each other in a deep way. So we feel very grateful for that wisdom, to be honest. That echoes something that some of our own soldiers say in the film, that they, they, they talk about what it was like to hear about the, the anti-war protests while they were still over there. And some of them articulated that, that point, that, it was a, that this is the very democracy they were fighting for, you know, and, and that this was a, something they valued in our society. As you can hear, I, I'm still recovering from, <laughs> from what you've done to me, and I, I've, got, I've got a few hours yet to go. Thank you for your time and for taking the immense amount of time it took to produce this film. You are uh, both to be praised, but you're also just incredibly lucky. I mean, to have your talents and your energy coincide with this moment and this material, I and mean, it's just, it's great. You are two people who have really found your moment, and you've, you've been doing that year after year after year on all these topics. It's, it's really beautiful to watch. I think we're very grateful for the opportunity to have the time to try to explain ourselves in depth but I do think there's a, a larger piece here that permits us at a particularly challenged moment in our national life uh, where we feel so beset by partisanship and disunion to perhaps be assuaged just a little bit by the fact that it was worse back then and that maybe by understanding a little bit about what happened back then that we might be able to muster the necessary tools, including listening to the other, to begin to reassert a great American strength of compromise and civil discourse and kind of shared sacrifice and, and, and shared objectives. It seems, perhaps because of the very instrument that we are communicating through, that we are all relatively lonely, um, disconnected, though hyper-connected, free agents. And I think that we yearn for community. And I, the work that Lynn and I do first and foremost in public broadcasting is exactly that, uh, emphasizing the unum uh, rather than the pluribus. And, and, and if we had any wish for the film, is that in some ways it might um, help uh, appeal to the better angels of our nature, that we might begin to have the kind of conversations we have been um, avoiding since the Vietnam War didn't turn out the way we thought it would. I'm glad you said that, Ken, because that is one message that comes through, if only subliminally, while you watch this, is that it was worse back then. I mean, the echoes are, are echoes, but 
you can see that, you know, whether you never knew it or you've forgotten, our society was coming apart at the seams in a way that it certainly isn't now. And uh, as uncomfortable as the present moment is in many respects politically, there's a lot to be grateful for even in the current circumstance because we are not where we were in 1968 and 69. That's right. And, and, and we can use history uh, to be that kind of armor that permits us to have the perspective about the present moment. And that's why you want to study history. It's very important to understand what happened there. This is a particularly good story uh, to tell, but it's only useful if it is applicable to the present, that we can transform the raw materials of story into experience and perhaps understanding and then applicable knowledge. Well, Ken, Lynn, thank you so much for taking the time, and I wish you the best of luck with this film. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. It was a wonderful conversation. It's really a great privilege. If you're enjoying the Waking Up podcast, there are many ways you can support it at samharris.org forward slash support. As a supporter of the podcast, you'll get early access to tickets to my live events, 